In this video I will show you how to build a superbike. It is not difficult but will cost money for parts. And engine work unless you can do your own engine build. Superbike racing uses stock machines, such as the Suzuki GSX R1000 or Yamaha R1, that have been modified for racing. This makes it similar to old school NASCAR, although today's NASCAR race cars have almost nothing in common with their stock counterparts other than the shape. Superbikes are much closer to the stock motorcycles they are based upon, which makes the sport unique from Grand Prix motorcycle racing, MotoGP where the motorcycles are designed from the ground up to be racing machines. The regulations put in place by Moto America, the governing body for American superbike racing, limit the modifications that can be made to the bikes, which presents an interesting engineering challenge for factory racing teams. You can, for example, completely replace the wheels, brakes, and the entire exhaust system. You cannot modify the frame or replace major components of the engine such as pistons, valves, and crankshaft, though you can tweak ignition timing and other engine controls. Engineers lighten the bikes, cutting them from about 430 pounds for a stock machine down to more like 370 pounds for a racer. They use exhaust systems with much better airflow in part because they don't have to adhere to EPA emissions regulations. The superbikes put out about 200 to 220 horsepower compared to roughly 160 on a stock machine. One of the things teams do to gain a competitive edge is upload different maps to an electronic control unit, ECU, in the bike. A map is a programmable set of instructions that can help with bike control in a variety of ways, providing traction and wheelie control, engine braking, and ignition timing instructions. For example, sensors send a signal when the rear wheel is spinning faster than the front wheel and the bike automatically reduces the power output to the drivetrain by limiting fuel supply, changing the ignition timing, or both. That's really the crux of what we do, says Herschel Oxia, the engine management and data acquisition technician for Yoshimura Suzuki Racing. We find the balance of pre-existing settings that we have used and settings that are specific to the track to find the fine line of using the aids effectively and not slowing the bike down. This process is new for every race. The riders almost never go out on the track with the same mapping twice. Weather temperature, track conditions, and rider style all have Oxia scrambling to come up with the best setup to give Yoshimura's riders an edge over the competition. Normally, on a race weekend, I'll make 50 some odd maps, he says. You can install an aftermarket ECU to use programmable maps on most modern motorcycles, and high-end bikes like the Ducati 1299 Panigale less even come equipped with sensors similar to what you would find on a racing superbike. But the variables are much more extreme for a racing team. When the bike is vertical, the suspension is moving, Oxia says. When the rider leans it over at 65 degrees and hits a bump, all those forces are now lateral, so the suspension doesn't move as much, and you're relying on the flex in the side wall of the tire and the flex of the frame and swing them and everything else. All these factors have to be considered when programming a map for a superbike race. Horsepower is an addictive thing. And while not a replacement for sheer riding ability, it will at some point in your riding career play a role in both going faster and having more fun at the racetrack. How do you go about getting more of it, assuming you've already made the more straightforward modifications like an exhaust, fuel controller, and or reflashed ECU? For anyone who wants to take his track day riding or racing to the next level, the answer is an engine build. Of course, that's a relatively broad answer, as the term engine build can mean any number of things depending on who you talk to and what you as the rider want, need. Adding to the complexity of the situation is that, in most supersport based builds, emphasis is not only placed on power gains but in building a more mechanically sound power plant, as in racing, or even track day riding, 
the many internal parts turning petrol into power are put under great stress over time, each component potentially wears down and clearances between integral pieces close or open up after multiple riding, racing seasons at five-figure revs. Here, we've reached out to longtime tuner Jeff Stern of Fastline Performance, who illustrates the important aspects of an engine build and removes some of the confusion surrounding the subject. Note that the objective with this is not to make it so that you can pop into your garage and rebuild your own engine but rather have a better idea of why it's important to go through your engine, what the more important changes are, and how those changes alter your engine's performance. The end goal being that, when the time comes, you can go to your tuner of choice with a better understanding of what you want and need and start the process of getting more of those things you crave, horsepower and assurance. Note also that every engine builder will have a slightly different opinion on what works and what doesn't, and your tuner of choice can, and likely will, take a slightly different approach in his quest for more power. All the same, every engine builder will have secrets that he'll remain tight-lipped about and will likely not open up to you about. You, much the opposite need to be forthcoming with information when you sit down with a tuner, being sure to clarify which fuel you plan to run and what kind of maintenance schedule you want for the engine. More than that, you'll want to talk about realistic goals for horsepower numbers, bearing in mind what you want to spend on the build and what rules you plan to abide by. Most super sport class rules, for example, Prohibit things like cylinder head porting and aftermarket pistons, modifications that would provide a more significant bump in performance. Then again, peak horsepower is not the primary goal with a standard engine build, Stern reminds us, ultimately suggesting that it's equally as important to build that lifeline back up. You know, for something like an R1, you can do some cylinder head work and degree the cams and make good power. But with 600s it starts to get even more difficult because they're already pretty tuned up from the factory. The cylinder heads are pretty good, not perfect, but they're pretty well designed, and so you're just making these specific tweaks to get the power you want here or there and just going through all of the original equipment parts. Tearing the engine down and inspecting those various parts will give you a better idea of what needs to be replaced and what can be reused with any surprises likely upping the cost of the rebuild. If it's, generally speaking, a decent running motor, it's a good bet that you're not going to have to spend a bunch of money on hard parts like rods, a crankshaft, or clutch basket, Stern says. But you do need to tear the engine down to the crankshaft and inspect absolutely everything so that you have a better idea of what needs to be replaced or can be reused. The big thing to check is that the cylinder bores are round, he adds. Because if the cylinder bores are hourglass shaped or worn, then when the piston comes up to top dead center it can have excessive rock over, which if it's got excessive rock and you run a tight combustion chamber squish number, that could be a problem since the piston comes up and will do this wiggle thing. If it's worn, the cylinders will need to be replated with nicozel and honed, Stern says of most current engines that have some form of cylinder plating rather than liners. The pistons need to be inspected too to make sure that the skirts haven't collapsed. And really, with all of this you're just making sure that you're starting with a good core, that everything is in good shape. Of course, if you end up reusing the pistons, you will want to clean up any excessive carbon buildup like above the top ring land, that way the combustion gases can get down and get the rings pressurized. If the cylinder bores are good, you'll still want to rehone them, not to remove material but to put a cross hatch into it. That gives you good ring seal, he says. The big end rod bores need to be inspected to make sure they're round, and the pin bores need to be inspected on the connecting rods, even though on most decent, low mile engines that stuff is generally fine. After a thorough inspection of all parts, it's time to go about making the changes that will garner added power. For Stern, who learned much of his tricks from the Yoshimura Suzuki squad, this means performing a valve job, or in other words, making cuts to the valve seat that will change where the valves sit when they're closed. Done via seat cutters, this will ultimately enhance airflow and valve seal, 
there are some specific numbers, and these numbers are going to vary from engine builder to engine builder, but the idea of the valve job is to, done properly, with the proper angles worked out on a flow bench, enhance the airflow and even possibly start the airflow earlier. Really, a lot of the power you make is going to be in the valve job, Stern says. Of course in the end you're doing multiple things, he continues. Part of it is you're getting the valve to seal the combustion chamber off during the combustion process. You want to contain the gases in the combustion chamber so that they can do their job, and that comes down to ring seal but also good valve seal. At the same time, you're trying to get better airflow. So with a good valve job, you can induce airflow more quickly as the valve comes off the seat. As an example, if the valve has to be 20 thousandths of an inch off the seat before the air starts flowing, then you're giving up that initial half millimeter of lift. And if you start behind, you're always going to be behind. Do it right though and you can increase power across the board. Important to note is that for most riders, Stern says it's important to not be too aggressive with valve seat angles, as in the end this could affect reliability. And you try to take as little material off as you can because the more valve jobs you do, the more you can sink the valve into the head and give up compression. So you really want to make the cuts in the valve seat as small as possible. And be careful to not sit there and grind and grind on the seat because eventually you'll have to replace the seat or scrap the head. But for reliability, as long as you don't run a really narrow margin, you're going to be totally fine. Increasing compression will likewise gain horsepower, though there are multiple ways to go about approaching this. The easiest way to add compression is to deck the block or go with a thin head gasket, both ultimately reducing the squish band, the outer portion of the combustion chamber where the piston comes closest to the cylinder head, Stern confirms, but a thinner head gasket isn't always an option, and a lot of times, I'd prefer to cut the block so that if I lose a customer, if he moves across the country or something, and he has somebody service his motorcycle, that person could just put a stock part back in his bike and not have a problem. Of course, every engine builder is going to have their opinion on what squish number is best, and for a super sport motor you'd want to run it on the safe side. For me, I know the customer is going to be running this for a year or so before it's inspected again so I wouldn't run the squish number as tight as I would for a motor that's going to get rebuilt after a few race weekends. You can take material off the cylinder head, though the effect can be less due to the shape of the combustion chamber. Taking material off of the cylinder head will also affect cam timing, as will a thinner head gasket. Cam timing Cam timing is another way to manipulate power, though Stern says that. In certain regards the cam timing is less important than getting compression in the motor. Some people think it's a fix all for everything, and in old times it could give you more power, but now it more just moves it. Unfortunately, it's also kind of a black art and takes a lot of diner time. And it depends a lot on other things, like your pipe, intake, or velocity stacks. That's an important point too that there's no single change that is the magic change. All of these changes work in conjunction, and it all has to be a complementing set of numbers. Still for most motors, especially like one for Moto America, I'd install cam sprockets and change the cam timing. And with that, there are some sweet spots where motor builders will want the cams to do their thing. But again, this will vary between engine builders. Of course, any gains here and same with the gains garnered from the other changes, will, again, only be truly seen when the bike is put on the dyno and properly tuned, the fuel injection mapping and ignition timing allowing the builder to fully exploit the benefits of each. Every engine builder will pay attention to smaller details as well, ultimately setting bearing clearances where they want them to be and replacing things like rod bolts, if they are stretch bolts or modifying the slipper clutch to make the slipper function better. For me, it's all coming out anyway, so I'll go through the transmission and inspect the transmission shift forks and shift drum, making sure to replace any worn or damaged transmission bits. Same for clutch plates, you know, if needed.
and at that point all of the gaskets are getting replaced. Some of the seals are getting replaced if there's a sign of a leak. I put manual cam chain tensioners in everything too. They just keep all the parts moving relative to one another in the time span you want them to. It keeps the cams in the location relative to the crank because if there's a big wave, like if guy is aggressive with his downshifts, and the chain is loose, it will put a bunch of slop in the chain and the cams could potentially flop the other way, and now you could possibly go into collision, valves hitting the piston. In the end, there are near countless things an engine builder could do for added performance or reliability, and these main areas are just the tip of the iceberg. How far you want to go depends on the rule book you plan, need to base the build off of and how much you want to spend. Keep in mind though that every change you make will need to complement the next, and that the other important part here is the inspection and replacement of necessary parts for improved assurances you roll out for your next race. And as is always the case, there will always be more you could do, or more power to be gained, through a valve job. Increased compression, and revised cam timing though, you can be well on your way to making more power, going quicker, and having more fun. It seems everyone is clued in that suspension setup can be a key to riding fast and safely, but how do you do it? No matter what shock or fork you have, they all require proper adjustment to work to their maximum potential. Suspension tuning isn't rocket science, and if you follow step-by-step -step procedures you can make remarkable improvements in your bike's handling characteristics. The first step to setting up any bike is to set the spring sag and determine if you have the correct rate springs. Spring sag is the amount the springs compress between fully topped out and fully loaded with the rider on board in riding position. It is also referred to as static ride height or static sag an advanced method of checking spring sag that I'll describe. If you've ever measured sag before, you may have noticed that if you check it three or four times, you can get three or four times, you can get three or four different numbers without changed anything. We'll tell you why this occurs and how to handle it. Rear end. Step 1, extend the suspension completely by getting the wheel off the ground. It helps to have a few friends around. On bikes with cider stands the bike can usually be carefully rocked up on the stand to unload the suspension. Most race stands will not work because the suspension will still be loaded by resting on the swing and rather than the wheel. Measure the distance from the axle vertically to some point on the chassis. Metric figures are easiest and more precise. Figure 1. Mark this reference point because you'll need to refer to it again. This measurement is L1. If the measurement is not exactly vertical the sag numbers will be inaccurate, too low. Step 2. Take the bike off the stand and put the rider on board in riding position. Have a third person balance the bike from the front. If accuracy is important to you, you must take friction of the linkage into account. This is where our procedure is different. We take two additional measurements. First. Push down on the rear end about 25 mm, 1 inch, and let it extend very slowly. Where it stops, measure the distance between the axle and the mark on chassis again. If there were no drag in the linkage the bike would come up a little further. It's important that you do not bounce. This measurement is L2. Step 3, have your assistant lift up on the rear of the bike about 25 mm and let it down very slowly. Where it stops, measure it. If there were no drag it would drop a little further. Remember, don't bounce. This measurement it L3. Step 4, the spring sag is in the middle of these two measurements. In fact, if there were no drag in the linkage, L2 and L3 would be the same. To get the actual sag figure you find the midpoint by averaging the two numbers and subtracting them from the fully extended measurement L1, static spring sag equals L1, L2 plus L3, 2. Step 5, adjust the preload with whatever method applies to your bike. Spring collars are common, and some benefit from the use of special tools. In a pinch you can use a blunt chisel to unlock the collars and turn the main adjusting collar. If you have too much sag you need more preload, if you have too little sag you need less preload.
For road race bikes, rear sag is typically 25 to 30 mm. Street riders usually use 30 to 35 mm. Bikes set up for the track are compromised when ridden on the street. The firmer settings commonly used on the track are generally not recommended, or desirable, for road work. You might notice the SAG Master measuring tool, available from Race Tech, in the pictures. It's a special tool made to assist you in measuring SAG by allowing you to read SAG directly without subtracting. It can also be used as a standard tape measure. Measuring front end SAG is very similar to the rear. However, it much more critical to take seal drag into account on the front end because it is more pronounced. Front end. Step 1. Extend the fork completely and measure from the wiper, the dust seal atop the slider, to the bottom of the triple clamp, or lower fork casting on inverted forks, figure 2. This measurement is L1. Step 2. Take the bike off the slider stand, and put the rider on board in riding position. Get an assistant to balance the bike from the rear, then push down on the front end and let it extend very slowly. Where it stops, measure the distance between the wiper and the bottom of the triple clamp again. Do not bounce. This measurement is L2. Step 3. Lift up on the front end and let it drop very slowly. Where it stops, measure again. Don't bounce. This measurement is L3. Once again, L2 and L3 are different due to stiction or drag in the seals and bushings, which is particularly high for telescopic front ends. Step 4, just as with the front, halfway between L2 and L3 is where the sag would be with no drag or stiction. Therefore L2 and L3 must be averaged and subtracted from L1 to calculate true spring sag. Static spring sag equals L1, L2 plus L3, 2. Step 5, to adjust sag use the preload adjusters, if available, or vary the length of the preload spaces inside the fork. Street bikes run between 25 and 33 percent of their total travel, which equates to 30 to 35 millimeters. Road race bikes usually run between 25 and 30 millimeters. This method of checking sag and taking stiction into account also allows you to check the drag of the linkage and seals. It follows that the greater the difference between the measurements, pushing down and pulling up, the worse the stiction. A good linkage, rear sag, has less than 3 mm, 0.12 inch, difference, and a bad one has more than 10 mm, 0.39 inches. Good forks have less than 15 mm difference, and we've seen forks with more than 50 mm. Gee, I wonder why they're harsh. It's important to stress that there is no magic number. If you like the feel of the bike with less or more sag than these guidelines, great. Your personal sag and front to rear sag bias will depend on chassis geometry, track or road conditions, tire selection and rider weight and riding preference. Using different sag front and rear will have huge effect on steering characteristics. More sag on the front or less sag on the rear will make the bike turn more slowly. Increasing sag will also decrease bottoming resistance, though spring rate has a bigger effect than sag. Racers often use less sag to keep the bike clearance, and since road races work greater than we see on the street, they require a stiffer setup. Of course, setting spring sag is only first step of dialing in your suspension. From street bike to superbike. It just takes time and money and the help of an engine builder if needed. Ride safe and don't forget to wear your helmet. And please subscribe and share this video.